So um, this unit um, uh, on support independence and well-being um, is um, one of the main units in the in the course. So we'll just go through. I'll try to make this brief. Um, talking about recognizing and supporting individual uh, differences. Um, so when we did the, the, the um, diversity unit, it did cover quite a bit of these um, next uh, sort of topics. Um, and in this unit, we have, um, you know, quite a, a bit of all the other units. It's kind of like a, um, a review in some sense of all the units. So uh, when we talk about spiritual uh, differences, um, uh, that's probably the key point in this um, unit. So I'll be talking a little bit more about spiritual things, but of course there's other individual differences like, you know, we have language differences, um, physical differences when you have, um, you know, old and young people, people with disability, people that are, are different than other people, intellectual differences, of course, social differences. So all of those things we have sort of already covered in a lot of other, other units. Um, but we continuously ask ourselves when we work with people um, with disabilities that in what ways can we respect their differences and how can we treat them um, in a way that uh, they expect to be treated? Um, how can we embrace their differences um, and how do we listen to them? So, uh, you know, that, that's very important. Um, that we really listen to our clients because they, they've been in their situation um, and, you know, have had their disability for many years. They know themselves better than anyone else. So uh, listening to them is, is very important. And then acknowledging when they say something to us. Um, you know, I've seen um, through the years when, uh, you know, you have to sometimes listen very carefully because sometimes, um, they raise the issue with you and uh, and you think, oh, it's nothing. Um, like I had this uh, one lady the one morning and I may have already told the story that she, um, uh, she I was helping her up. It was like six o'clock in the morning and I helped her up and I sat her in the wheelchair. And when um, I was at her feet putting her shoes on and I was sort of at eye level with her, she said to me something like really strange. She said, oh, this night nurse must think he can get fresh with me. And, you know, and I thought, oh, that's a bit of a strange thing to say. Anyways, um, and she didn't elaborate. And I, I, I don't think I even asked her anything more about it. But uh, the later in that week, probably about two days or so later, another lady called me over. And she said to me, um, you know, the night nurse touched my breast last night. And... Um, you know, had that other lady not say that to me on the Monday morning, you know, he must not get fresh with me. Um, this lady that called me over and complained about the, the night nurse touching her breast, she, uh, she was a little bit of a naughty person. So she used to get into trouble with the night people because she was a smoker. So um, they always had arguments with her and she was a bit, um, you know, a bit of a troublemaker. So I probably would have ignored her as well um, because when she called me over, it was, she was at, at the dining table and she said to me, and I have already told that Aaron and that Ian and both the Aaron and the Ian was in their dining room busy with the tablets and they were standing there at their trolleys and she pointed to them and um, they ignored me, she said. So I probably would have ignored her as well because, you know, she had this reputation. You know, I, I talk about the Paul, uh, Paul Wolf story. Um, but because this other woman said to me on the Monday morning that he, the night nurse mustn't think he can get fresh with me, that sort of being in the back of my mind uh, made me realize that there's something more to this, you know. So when I then called the, the CN, the clinical nurse, and reported it, uh, and anyways, we have to report it, and what that RN and EN did was wrong. I mean, regardless of whether we believe somebody or they are troublemakers, we still have to report it. But sometimes, you know, it just sort of helps us to understand the person better if we really just listen to them. And like I say, sometimes these 
remarks or comments they have may be very insignificant at the time and maybe later on we realize when they when they say something that um that they you know they've actually it had a deeper meaning or there was actually something behind what they say um you know so we really need to be careful to to acknowledge people's views and um, understand them as we work with them so the three dimensions of, of, of a human being is their physical dimension, then that could a psychological dimension and the spiritual dimension. So we as care workers, we spend a lot of time on the physical part of their care. We, you know, we help them up in the morning, we get them dressed, we get them ready for the day. We give them food, uh, you know, we care for them on their physical, you know, like, for their physical needs um then sometimes to a certain extent we also care for the psychological needs because we will listen to them we'll be there for them um you know we will encourage them when they feel down you know we will report when they are very tearful or there's any psychological problems um, if we work in dementia or with people with um, autism or that type of thing, it's a very psychological job. It's a lot more about managing their behaviors and things like that. But there's another aspect that we don't often give a thought about. And this unit is a little bit more focused on that. And that's the spiritual aspect in our care. Um, I suppose when you work in... Um, in aged care, we do the unit on um, on uh, um, palliative care, where we talk a little bit more on spiritual on the spiritual care. So uh, when we work with elderly people specifically, um, this uh, subject will probably be a little bit more prominent. Um, but uh, you know, when we work with people with disability, they may not necessarily give uh, the spiritual aspect of their lives um, a, a huge amount of thought. Normally people um, probably, unless they are very spiritual, um, just think about spiritual things and their last days, you know. But um, nevertheless, it's part of our, our um, responsibility to also care for that. And therefore we need to sort of um, know what it means and what's the principles behind um, this type of care. So we need to be aware that spiritual care does not mean um, we have to convert that person to what we believe, um, our religious points of views. Spiritual needs is, uh, needs to be met through the client's own resources. So whatever their um, background is, if they are Hindu or Buddhist or uh, Muslim or Christian or um, you know whatever their spiritual background is, that's where we should be meeting them. And if we haven't got the tools to meet them in there, or we don't have the knowledge about their religion, then we are the facilitators to find them the correct people to help them with that. So um, when you you identify the client's spiritual needs, uh, we need to document it so that the care can be consistent. So everyone can know. So obviously, if you look after somebody, say that is a Hindu, um, and they do not eat beef, everyone needs to know that, you know. If it's a disabled person and they may not be able to say, you can't just drizzle off to you know, um, Maccas and buy them a beef burger um, because that is against their religion. So everyone needs to be aware of what is, you know, their religion and what is the requirements around their religion. Um, and therefore we need to, when we find these things out, we need to document it. Um, we also have to react on the spiritual needs as by their request and with their consent. So they have to give us a consent, just like they have to give us consent to care for them physically or even psychologically, we also have to uh, get consent, especially for spiritual needs. Uh, because spiritual care is sensitive and it involves uh, the awareness of the person's culture, their social, spiritual differences, as well as um, respect for their religious beliefs and practices. Be, be aware, like I said a, a minute ago, of our limitations. If we don't know what this religion entails or you know what to do or say to them uh, we must refer this to somebody that has the knowledge whether it's a pastor or you know um, 
specifically, I suppose this point six is more focused on, on end of life key if they um, may need a pass to that need to see. So avoid opposing your own values and attitudes on others and support the person to express their own identity and preferences, our own values and principles. Um, that is the qualities that we attach worth to. So, you know, uh, for example, for myself, like my family is very important. Um, my granddaughter is very important. So for me, um, those type of things are, are a huge part of who I am. Um, uh, so that affects the way I may, uh, uh, my attitude towards somebody that hasn't got children or somebody that do not care for their children properly. I may, you know, be a bit biased in that. Um, it uh, guides the way that we live our lives and our attitudes can be related to our beliefs or our feelings. And it describes what we think um, in a proper way. Uh, it might not be right uh, or wrong um, a, a attitude or a value. Um, say, for example, somebody puts great value to um, the physical, um, you know, all the, the uh, earthly belongings, they've got beautiful house and they put a lot of a value to, to you know, uh, keeping everything really beautiful. And somebody comes in and are careless and just break their things. Um, that would be very highly offensive, offensive to them. Or if I am a person that do not put great value to to uh, to that type of thing, I might think, oh, that's stupid, and they don't value their family, or you know, and and judge them on that. It's not right or wrong, you know. My dad, for example, he was a person that had no ambition. He would just be very happy to have nothing, and. Um, and for a long time in my life, because I'm a very ambitious person, that was like, there's something wrong with him, you know, and I judged him until I got, when I got older and I realized that, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. If somebody has a different view of life or, you know, they, they put a different value to things. So um, we just have to, you know, learn to um, trust and, and, and treat people in a proper way. Um, so just because uh, you have to respect someone else doesn't mean um, you can't uh, have your own uh, attitudes or your own beliefs, um, you know, we still have also um, the right to have our own boundaries and our own, you know, we don't have to compromise our own beliefs, I suppose, when we're dealing with somebody else. For example, if I'm a Christian and I take an, uh, um, somebody that's Muslim to the mosque, I don't have to compromise my religion to go and into the mosque because you know they Muslim. I can just wait for them outside. I have to find a balance in that. That um, you know I don't. Um, yeah, I don't put myself in a place where I don't want to be. Um, obviously, I have to do that in a respectful way. So think about your own values and attitudes. And we've done a lot of this um, during um, the unit in. Um, in diversity so avoid opposing your own attitudes in on people support them on the basis that they got their values be self-aware identify the consequences if we don't care for them properly find better options like i said uh, adopt a neutral position so you know just find that way we can sit in the car can find a different way of dealing with this and let the client make their own decisions um this so another principle may be you have a client that wants to go to the girlies pub and he wants to go and sit in there and you know uh, what do I do um so you know and especially if it's a disabled person that needs somebody to be with them all the time you might have to you know, say to your company, no, you're going to have to find a different carer, maybe a male carer that can be there. Um, yeah, and listening to your clients. Um, support the clients express their identity. They have the right to express who they are and what they want out of life. Um, and we have to support them because they are unique. So consider the person's individual stages of life. Um, 
uh, and development and strengths in engaging in support activities. So stages of life really is, you know, uh, when they baby or when they toddler or they are a teenager or, you know, young adult or middle age or elderly. So those stages of life are important. And sometimes when somebody has mental disabilities, they, um, they may, uh, you know, in their mind, they may be in a different stage of life than what they physically are. So we have to also consider that. Um, a great part of our, our, one of our last units we'll be doing is uh, the master hierarchy of needs that reflects a lot on, um, on the way we treat people because it identifies that um, that people have needs, and if these needs are not met, um, it's our responsibility to meet the needs. And sometimes, when when they have a need and they cannot communicate the need to us, if somebody's got dementia and they can't tell you that they want to go to the toilet, um, they may start uh, pacing up and down, or they may. Um, you know, start getting aggressive, start wanting to hit somebody else. Or, you know, it's dinner time, they have to sit down at the dining room, eat their dinner, but they keep jumping up and walking away. You keep calling them back. And you don't realize that, oh, maybe they want to just go to the toilet first. So, um, and recognizing that people have different types of needs, um, it also helps us to deal sometimes with difficult behaviors that we don't know how, you know, um, why are they doing that? So we need to try to identify. So the basic needs would be um, that somebody's maybe hungry, they're thirsty, they're too warm, they're too cold, they need to rest. Um, then there's sometimes the safety needs, so um, they feel scared or um, insecure. Um, everyone needs to belong to somebody, you know, you get, um, I've had so many elderly um, uh ladies specifically that um, they miss their family and then um, they would start pacing up and down although they can't walk and and every time they get up they will fall and trying to get them to sit still and then you realize or trying them to get them to settle when they like restless um, it quite often is because they are missing their family and um, you know, and then just give the, the son or the daughter a call and say, look, mom's very restless. Can you make a turn? And they will give you small indications. This is, again, listening to them very carefully because she will say, um, she'll start saying, oh, there's dad. Or she will say, um, uh, there, there is my husband. There's my husband. And she wants to get up and go and see because she saw a man walk past. And then you realize she's not actually talking about her husband. She's talking about her son um, because they may forget um you know the person's name or, or you know be in a different um mindset so but realizing they have that need to uh, have intimate relationship or friends around um then also feeling accomplished and you know having the need to try do something sometimes it's just like oh uh, you know a, Get, giving them a cloth to wipe the table or giving them some purpose for the day because they feel like they're not doing anything. They're just sitting around. So we have to be creative. And then um, it's about, you know, reaching potential. And these principles apply, of course, with somebody with disabilities that, you know, finding jobs for them, helping them to get into the community, helping them to live by themselves and things like that. Um, and I've already mentioned the stages of life. Um, yeah, so recognize and support the individual differences in accommodating the person to express their own identity and sexuality as appropriate in the context of the age and the stage of life. Uh, realizing that um, the the person, you know, obviously if they're a teenager that, um, you know, or a young adult that they have needs to be with a partner even though they may not be able to communicate there's that lovely um show on um i, th I think it's on uh netflix but i think it's also on sbs you can do it on cash up tv it's called um a love on the spectrum where these young adults with uh, autism are, you know, are communicating the, the need that they want partners or they want to go out and they want to get married and they want children, you know, and at some stage, um, uh, and 
previous years, people were treating people with um, uh, with Down syndrome, for example, as they can be, uh, you know, I mean, that's just a huge generalization, but sometimes somebody with Down syndrome can be very affectionate. And they, and I looked after a Down syndrome lady and she always used to say, I'm getting married next week. And it was just her biggest dream to get married and, uh, you know, and, um, and, uh, and belong and have that cuddles and, and love. And at some stage in earlier years, people used to prevent people with Down syndrome to get married because they'd go, oh, you know, it's almost like we want to control them like uh, stock animals like it, because it's got a defect. You don't want to pass on your defect. And that is just disgusting. I've got a very, very close friend. Um, his daughter is um, has Down syndrome and she met her husband. He's got a disability too. I think he's got a, a, a short arm. He's one of, I don't know whether he's got some, was born like that or, or um you know, he had were an accident, but uh, she met him and and they happily married and they have a little girl and she um, she's very high functioning and she does everything, you know, her name's Lisa, she's just a beautiful young young person and and she's living her life fully the way she wants to. So um expressing sexuality, I've had some older boys that in the eighties, um, you know, taking a fancy to another old boy and sitting at the table holding hands and, you know, walking around holding hands and tucking each other in, you know, and we were strongly encouraged by our employer that they have the right to express their identity, you know, their sexual identity. But I think in some ways it was more like a childhood friendship for them. But, you know, the family didn't understand that. When they come in, and they're like, oh, you know, how can dad know? He's got children and a wife and the wife must still be alive and stuff. So it's our, our job to sort of protect him. But as well as explain to the family that this can be a very innocent thing, you know. It may be, especially when somebody's got dementia, they, they tend to, um, you know, uh, remember when they when they were little um, more um, vividly than what they actually even remember their own children. So um, yeah, it's just important for us to um, you know give them that benefit of the doubt. So um, yeah, uh, so they have the freedom to express. Hi, can you just put your um, your thing on, uh, Joe? Hi there. Hello. <laughs> can you can you just get put it on? Um, I might just quickly have a pause here. Yeah. So, um, allowing them to openly talk to you about it. We also had a um a couple. Um, well, they actually met each other in the hospital, and when they came into care. Um, they, you know, they were a couple and they were together and we had to express, uh, you know, give them the opportunity to express themselves, allow them to openly be together. We had another old couple that, um, the one, uh, they were actually both married still. Um, and the husband used to come and visit quite often. And they, and she used to sit really close to the other old boy and hold his hand all day. And, you know, but the, uh, luckily the husband actually understood where she was at, um, you know, in sort of, uh, in her mind, she was a, a young girl and she, she just needed that, um, that uh, closeness with somebody else, you know, so, um, like they always say, no man is an island. So as humans, we're not made to be alone. And we have to understand that quite often this is actually just an act of, of you know, um, like an innocent act in some way. So, um, yeah. So um, don't make a, a se uh, the sexuality, you know, talking about sex and taboo subject either. Sometimes they may want to talk about that. I've had a student in the class some time ago and she was saying they used to go to this group meetings they have, um, they're called uh, snags. Um, I forget what it stands for. Anyway, it's a young group. It's a group of uh, disabled people in Makai that get together and they go to um, clubs and, and uh, uh, you know, like some of the bowls clubs in there and uh, on weekends. And sometimes they have karaoke nights and other times they have disco and, you know, or they play games or things like that. So, but it's a social club. And, um, and, uh, 
different uh, young adults get together from different companies. So there was, she took her uh, client she was looking after, I forget whether it was a male or female, to this meeting and, and I had um, build up a friendship with a, a person from another company, uh, you know, another care worker was looking after this person. And the care worker was trying to prevent them from having a friendship, even sitting next to each other, you know, and that's like, what business is that of yours, you know? Yeah, no, but the family doesn't want them to, or whatever their reason was, or the company said, I must, um, you know, we really have a responsibility to facilitate them um, to make their own decisions. And if they want to take um, each other's phone numbers and if they want to have sex, then the, it's our, our place to facilitate that safely. They have the right to make those decisions, especially if they're adults, of course, adults. Um, yeah, so promote and facilitate opportunities and participation in activities that reflect the individual physical, social, cultural, and spiritual needs. Um, you know, obviously we spend a lot of time on the physical needs, we spend a lot of time on the social needs, but we don't always spend that much time on spiritual needs. Um, sometimes cultural needs is also met, but yeah, um, realizing that people have that, um, have more needs than that. So promoting independence. Um, now look, um, this unit specifically, like I said earlier, is... Um, uh, you know, a lot uh, has got uh, um, uh, uh, like a review of other units and the main um, units that this is covered in this uh, unit 23 is the disability unit. So um, we will actually talk a lot about promoting independence in, I think it's unit DIS 001 and 002, um, but, uh, and 003, um, you know, but uh, this is then not a summary, but more like, uh, um, you know, uh, sort of, uh, touching on what's to come in the next four units that we're going to be doing. Um, but um, when you work out in disability, um, there is a huge focus on promoting independence um, or, you know, in these cell houses they have, um, supported independent living or, you know, um, and NDIs has a huge focus on, on uh, helping clients to become more independent. But this principle also applies when we work with people with um, elderly people, because if you don't use it, you lose it. So it's about, you know, um, uh, allowing our clients, I suppose, to, to brush their own teeth, to wash their own face, to take, because sometimes we get impatient because we just want to get it done and we short staff and, you know, we take those opportunities away from them to be able to um, do things for themselves. So, um, and I know it's hard and I know you guys are even shorter these days than what, you know, I was when I was still in the HK facilities. But, um, you know, it's really important because, uh, and I've said this so many times before, because if we take those opportunities away from them, um, they'll end up um, trying to take chances when we are not around. And those, most of the time, that's when they fall or they get hurt. And then at the end, it's actually, it actually takes more time out of our busy schedule to go back and monitor them or pick them up from the ground. So it's better we, we help them to get this out of their system because it's a human need to be able to be independent, especially older ladies, you know, they, they still have, they were busy women and all their lives they may have had many children and husbands and grandchildren they cared for. So um, when they get older, they still have this, this huge need that they still want to, um, you know, do things for themselves. So, you know, walk to the bathroom and, you know, just take that five, 10 minutes um, out of your time um, to let them do that because you save yourself some time in the long run instead of going back and, you know, having to patch them up because they've had a huge fall. So promoting independence um, is one of the most important attributes um, that a person can possess. Um, and uh, it's essential to promote independence for clients, encourage them to do as much pos uh, as possible. Um, 
and this is all uh, level, you know, it all depends on from person to person how much they can actually do. Um, there was a um, documentary some years ago, some, um, uh, it was kind of one of these um, uh, reality shows they made in the UK, uh, where um, they had a couple of old people, well, not a couple, they had a house of old people, I think there was about six of them, like a, a big brother house, and they, they um, actually left them to their own devices. And although some of these people have already received sort of care support, um, they were then left by themselves and they were recorded. And it landed up that they were starting to do more things for themselves than what they previously did because they had to. So sometimes we do take um, independence away from them because we can or because we are there, um, that if we were not there or we did stand back, they probably can still do some things for themselves. So yeah, it's really important to remember. And, uh, but of course, identifying their strengths, um, to, uh, to acknowledge their strengths and uh, then to support on these, to draw on these strengths, you know, you know, they can still do some stuff. Um, their value skills, their knowledge, their abilities, um, and uh, allow them to lead um, and be in control of their care. Tell us what they want us to do, not the other way around. Uh, we're not there to boss over them, and that is the new HK standards. It's it's based on that that you know it's their dignity and choices, what they want. So we really have to focus on that. Um, I mean, really just think about how would you like somebody to treat you when you get there? Would you, when you and an older child, how, you know, how would you want to be treated? So just keep that, uh, the, you know, at the front of our key. Um, yeah, uh, they still have the self-care capabilities um, and we just have to identify and acknowledge that, that and um, uh, self-care capabilities. And these things are, related to managing their own health, taking care of themselves, identify what they want or they need and um, how can we help them to achieve that. And it starts with something as simple as just ask them really, isn't it? So assist the person to identify opportunities to utilize their strengths while communicating the importance of using availability or support as needed. Yeah, just, um, a little bit more of what we already spoke about. Um, you know, what uh, task can we give them uh, a chance to uh, be independent? How, what is there something small that we can do? Like give an old girl a, a cloth and tell her to wipe the tables after dinner while she's pacing up and down, you know? Um, yeah, match, match tasks to the client's abilities and skills. And, you know, this is all a little bit of a, um, a being sensitive to the situation and being sensitive to your clients. Knowing your clients is the most important thing, you know, when we build rapport and we get to know them really well. Uh, provide information and assist them to, um, to order or to facilitate access to support services and resources when needed. So in the community, this is more applicable, helping them with the pension cards, travel cards, um, you know, uh, Medicare requests and all those type of things, putting them on the phone to do the, do the talking. Uh, provide support that allows the person to manage their own service deliveries, the same or similar to what we just said. Encourage them uh, to both strengthen and maintain independence, and this is what it's all about. As we know how important this is, we uh, encourage them and allow them to be independent. Um, you know, even redesigning the room in a way that it allows them to be able to walk around or like they would come in into if you've got an elderly person at home and put some rails up or put, a, you know, a, um, a ramp at the door or, you know, make it, put a rail down the stairs so it's easier for them to walk up and down so they can still do things or in their bathrooms, redesign, they sometimes redesign the bathrooms for them so they'd be able to go in there and, and, and get themselves around. Um, yeah, so, 
they may have to learn new skills and how to say you work with somebody with a disability and they've recently had a car accident and now they have to learn how to adjust to be in a wheelchair and they have to learn how to um, new skills on how to um, get themselves around um, but always disrespecting them and giving them those opportunities so um, with the physical well-being uh, a promoting encouraging daily living habits and contribute healthy uh, lifestyle. Um, we've spoken quite a bit already about this and we will speak a lot more. We've got another unit where we talk about healthy lifestyle. Um, yeah, so just making good choices. We spoke a lot about that in, in healthy bodies actually um, uh, and um, educate people about their health. Um, fitness and that is quite often part of their care plans that you know especially out in the community that they they do some other activities some other sport whether it's uh water aerobics or you know um bowling or you know when you take them to caneland stop a bit further away because they mean to walk two kilometers a day or something like that um making sure that they're getting enough rest and you know and that they um, nutrition and hydration, that's really, really important, especially in Macau where it's so hot that we make sure they drink enough water um, because that reflects, like we said, in healthy bodies as well. It, it has a huge impact on their skin integrity. And if somebody is not drinking enough water, they're more likely to get a bed sore. So every time you go into a client's room when you're in an old age home, give them a sip of water. They quite often can't reach the water or they can't you know, it's just out of their the reach. So every time we care for them, we give them a drink. Um, that's really, really important. Um, managing stress effectively um, and abstain from bad habits and addictions. That may be a, um, quite a, a important when we work with people with disability. So um, encourage them to eat nutritious. Um, sometimes you have to, you know, like, oh, let's eat this bit first before we eat the pudding. Most people with disabilities, as well as our elderly people, they do like this sweet stuff a lot more <laughs> in normal food. Um, and, you know, of course, we're not going to force ourselves on them. We're not going to force our ways, but we want to just go a little bit extra mile, not just give in at the first Wimp, but say you know oh come on let's just try a little bit more of this we just have to always do that like encouraging thing um we were not, not just always like okay it's their choice and you know whatever um yeah of course they don't have huge value of life and of course um if they want to eat something sweet you know and they've only you know they're 88 or 96 or whatever um uh it's their choice but you know trying to still maintain their skin integrity that the last four or ten years of their life is not they're not living in agony because they've got a huge back, uh, bed sore on their bum or something like that um yeah uh we've spoken about some other other things support and assistable to maintain safe and healthy environment um help them in safe environment, healthy environment, of course, keeping their houses clean when you work in, in their homes, uh, keeping the fridges clean, uh, enabling them to be independent, help them um, uh, uh, keep um, busy, uh, uh, take pride in their surroundings, make it pretty for them, find out what they like, if they want, you know, our photos of the children up on the wall that we can maybe facilitate to get that done, you know, make it their own environment so they don't feel like um, they're living in somebody else's home, but they're actually living in their own place, you know, it's the things around them. Um, encourage them to uh, maintain a safe environment, you know, in the community as well, if there is some clutter around or there's some things that might be dangerous that we remove those or encourage them to remove those. Uh, yeah, um, when it isn't possible, you may need to uh, uh, support and um, you may need support, you may need to call in somebody to come and help you if they don't want to change something. I remember looking after, uh, um, she was actually a doctor and she got lupus and um, 
she had so much clutter in her house it was actually really dangerous um and uh, yeah she eventually fired me um <laughs> because i i was near you know I, I her bird flew away but um and it was my job to feed the birds but um you know her it was so hard because some care companies actually refused to work with her because it was too dangerous for them to be in her house and um, there was just too many aspects of you know the the environment that wasn't safe um yeah uh, critical care and support settings um you know uh, when there is an issue that we're there and we find help clean environment is really really important you know you don't want to work in an environment where you can get sick um uh, so it's also our own health risk that we need to bear in mind with comfortable environment of course it is important um, that they feel safe identify hazards um, and report according to organization policies and procedures now we've done all these hazard things in our work health and safety unit um, just you know equipment looking at equipment making sure everything is in work, good working order if it's not we report it we tell somebody that this needs to be fixed uh, we do those risk assessments um we report we always report to our supervisor uh we go back to our policies and procedures and look at what is in there and what is the company want us to do about that um yeah uh, and get some training ourselves in and of course, with uh, with the work health and safety, um, most companies do the induction every year, not induction, but like uh, compulsories. And the compulsories are basically the, the work health and safety things, as well as like the fire drill or the fire um, unit. So um, manual handling, those things are all sort of um, important to get done yearly uh, most companies won't allow you to work unless you've done a, a refresher on that it's like on mine sites they've got the working at high things and stuff like that so it's our responsibility to make sure that we keep up to date with these things um, it's not um, necessary that it's not necessary for us to keep our qualification but it may be necessary for us to keep our job to make sure we've attended the compulsories every year so um, identify variations in the person's physical condition and report according to organization policies. It's a huge part of our job. We walk in in the morning, we see that person is not feeling well, she looks all flustered, she's saying funny things, that we immediately report that because we know this person's acting out of character, something's wrong, something's up. So. Um, that uh, it gets, you know, the doctor get called or, you know, we, we check what is the problem, we find out what the problem is um, sooner than later. So, you know, um, recognize indications that the person's physical situation is affected in their well, well-being and report according to organization policies and procedures. Some variations in the client's physical condition may be changes, may be like they may have aches and pains, they can't wake bed, they can't stand up today. Um, they're not feeling well, uh, their nails, our nails gives a lot away about ourselves if it's all um, broken and, um, you know, this you can see when a person's not healthy. Um, our mouth, oral health is really, really important. Um, our skin and bone color, just the color, you know, person's color, you can walk in in a room and you can see, you know, sometimes up, or something's off because just of their color. Um, weight gain or weight loss, sometimes um, that's a huge indicator. But quite often it's like, oh, they just missed one meal and we didn't record it and they missed another meal or they just eat sweets and they start losing weight. So, um, but it could also be indicator of something else. So we always have to report all of these conditions. Looking out for when not, not be able to look after themselves when they're confused, upset, sad, and depressed. There's actually um, really um, a huge need in the elderly to um, uh, for the um, uh, like the psychological care that is not always met because we don't really have those skills. Um, you know, we're not. Um, 
qualified to sort of evaluate that they are depressed or not. Um, and it's not part of normal aging. It's not, it's not okay for Nana to be sad all the time. Um, we really need to support them and, and find help them find solutions um, for, you know, when they don't feel well, when they're emotionally distressed. Um, when they're extremely tired, uh, when their characters change, um, yeah, when they're not always, when they're not doing the usual thing, they don't want to go somewhere, they don't, you know, we just really, all of these little things can be nothing or it can be something really big or the start of something really big. It's really just important for us to report these things, record it as well. And when you report it in the, in the, in the files, say who you reported it to. I called the RN, RN um, Josie or RN uh, Smith and I um, reported that client was not looking well or clients agitated or clients are not going to activities. Because sometimes it takes um, quite a lot of effort from us as uh, AINs or individual support workers to raise issues with the RNs um, or with the doctors because they ignore our reports. Um, and we already have got a feeling something is going on, something's wrong, and they're not listening to us. And only when the issue starts spiraling out of control, they go, oh, okay, oh, maybe she's got like cancer or something stupid like that. And then it's really, you know, already completely out of control because they didn't listen to us. So it's really important that we keep on nagging you know, we are the advocates for elderly people, and this unit is actually really focused on elderly people um, to advocate for them when they're not feeling well and when they're not in a good place, because um, no one else is. And, you know, we are the ones that are the first responders seeing these things. So, um, uh, and sometimes things are out of our scope. We can't go and change it, you know? So we identify these things, they're out of our scope. We can't do anything about it have to report it and yeah but sadly the the RNs are just too busy or there's too little of them around to actually do something about it um you know we just have to keep reporting it um yeah uh chapter four support social emotional psychological well-being promote self-esteem and confidence through the use of positive and supportive communication um always treating people with respect uh you know there's that saying familiarity breeds content when we become very familiar if we've looked after old joe for the last 15 years we might be joking around with him and you know uh, teasing him and you know and really that is in some ways a little bit disrespectful um and especially for bystanders, they don't know the dynamics of our relationships. So we really have to always stay professional, even if we've been working with the same person for many years, we still have to maintain that professional boundaries. Um, it, uh, you know, it is just really a matter of respect. Uh, always treat them as they are an important member of society, empower them, show them uh, that they have the ability to do things, uh, promote positive supportive communication, talk to them, ask them, you know, repeat back to them what they say to us to make sure we understand them well, never judge people, um, you know, we just try to find solutions and helping them to deal with things and solving their problems. Um, Examples of positive and supportive communication is giving the clients time to talk. Um, don't complete these sentences. You know, it's so annoying when you when you work with somebody that while well, well, the person is still talking, they finish their sentence or, you know, it's also a huge um, uh, uh, dis disrespectful thing to do. So just give them time and space to talk. And elderly people takes longer to, to communicate, you know, they take a bit more time to get to the place to process what they want to say, or maybe they're just a little bit more thoughtful than what we are. They're not just going to blur things out because they've learned through the years that 
um, some things best remain unsaid, really. So listen to them, like I said in the beginning of this unit, show interest in what they are saying, making eye contact. You know, they always have this saying that we've only got one mouth and two ears, so we need to use our two ears more than what use, we use our mouth. Valuing their opinions, never judge, reassure them when they need it, uh, be helpful, kind and compassionate. That's really hard. That's really the, the foundation of our jobs is being uh, compassionate and kind. Uh, be optimistic, encouraging, uh, be constructive in our advice. So just supporting them. Um, contribute to their sense of security through the use of safe, predictable routines. It's really important for elderly people that um, their routine stays the same. Um, not talking about that. So having a cup of coffee in the morning, every morning, that's part of the, the you know, before you get up, that's what they want, that's what they get. Um, you know, going somewhere uh, once a week, specific place, always doing that, always going to bed at a certain time, um, you know, have a family member visiting at a certain time, uh, having a shower at a certain time, they you know, some people might prefer to have a shower in the evening or some wants to get up four o'clock in the morning and shower because they are old can farmer and that's what they always used to do. Um, yeah, so just doing this predict predictable routines, it's, it, it's also a type of security for somebody that may be developing dementia um, that, uh, you know, that helps them feel safe. I uh, know a lot of these things go out the window really when they do get dementia because you know they it's upside down morning is night and night is morning and things are all a mess for them um and just understanding you know where they're at it's really just um we still the predictable routines can still be important because having a little rest after lunch you know um it really helps them to settle and switch off a bit and help that they don't get to that place where they have this uh, sundowners where they just rush around and get all, you know, hyperactive in the late afternoon. And quite often that is because they haven't had the opportunity to, you know, dim the lights after lunch, put soft music on, um, not keeping busy, you know, um, it's really important just to settle them a little bit, um, read the mood. You know, encourage to facilitate and facilitate participation in social, cultural, spiritual activities using existing potential or new networks as the person's preferences, social activities, inclusion, social interaction as many benefits. Also helps with dementia hugely for them to be interactive. Um, being in touch with their, their family and their friends. Sometimes it's our job to remind the family to come and visit them, um, sadly. Yeah, uh, making new friends, you know. Identify aspects to support the well-being outside our scope of practice and uh, our, our, and skills in our job role. And, you know, uh, there may be many aspects that uh, of their well-being outside. Of course, there is, you know. Uh, if you don't know how to do something, just don't do it, you know, just phone a supervisor, just refuse, even if they do pressure you, because at the end of the day, if, you know, you haven't got the qualification for that, you um, may close it all for yourself for the rest of your life, because quite often these things go into a yellow card and we won't be able to get a job again. Um, just find somebody, and I know this is a tall order, um, but it stays one of the most important important principles and unfortunately in today's care, um, both in community and disability um, and um, uh, facilities that, um, you know, we expected to do things that we are not trained for. Identify variations in their well-being and report. We've already spoken a bit about that. Um, you know, this is probably more on the emotional, psychological well-being. Identify cultural financial issues that impact the uh, well-being. Um, they can't go to church or wear their ceremonies. Um, they're unable to wear their cultural clothing. Uh, they can't get the right food. You know, you may be looking after somebody that um, is a Hindu or Muslim and, and the kitchen only does what they do, you know, and they don't have the choice. So 
you know, and understanding, you know, oh, this is old boy actually, you know, he doesn't eat pork or he doesn't eat that. Um, and not forcing them to, you know, but looking after, advocating uh, for them with our kitchens and our management as well for the correct food. Um, not to discriminate against that. Um, financial issues, you'll see this a lot in HK that um, our poor elderly people haven't got enough. They haven't got um, shampoos, they haven't got soap, they haven't got clothing, um, they haven't got shoes. Um, it is appalling, but it's in fact. Um, out in the community, it's even worse because sometimes um, the elderly people get um, taken advantage of our even family, um, you know, making them sign away the belongings to the grandson or the granddaughter or coming in and taking advantage of them. Um, we are the advocates. We have to report these things. If you see these things happening, make a noise. You know, go all the way if you have to. Financial abuse is a, um, a, a criminal offence and we can report this to the police. So um, we have to look out for them. Identify if the person is at risk um, to put uh, protective factors in place, specifically in mental health. Um, now, mental health, of course, can be dementia as well. Uh, it's essential in uh, uh, them receiving the right support um, and keeping them independent, um, helping them to cope. Uh, poor mental health is, uh, has got a major impact on them. So it's important to identify the risks, of course, uh, when they, especially out in the community, when they're by themselves and they're starting to become forgetful um, and, you know, or they're overly um, emotional and stuff. Um, and, you know, chronic illness, low self-esteem, uh, poor social skills, mm -hmm. poor physical health, um, uh, neglect, uh, social economical issues all has, uh, you know, risk on people's mental health. It all has effect on us when we are struggling in some areas of our life, we can feel down and it's just normal for people to be like that, but it's not normal to stay like that. So we have to, you know, identify these things and put some protective factors in place, um, you know, help to reconnect with people. If you've identified the person is too lonely, she's too by, too much by herself, like I said, sometimes it takes, you know, it's us to tell the family to, you know, come and visit for a change. Mom's very alone, she's very tearful, and she actually is just missing you, that's all. And the family is so busy and they think mom's okay and they don't realize it. And they may not mean sometimes to not visit or they may not even give it a thought or not realize where mom's at. And that's why uh, we have the right to call them and say to them, you may not realize, you, you know, you may think mom's okay. Find a way to communicate it in a respectful way. Of course, we don't want to blame them or, or be disrespectful towards them, but we still need to advocate for mom's well-being or for Nana's well-being or uh, grandpa's well-being because, you know, we are the ones that are caring for them. Um, so recognize and report possible indications of abuse and neglect uh, according to organization policies and procedures. Um, identify situations beyond your scope and report. Abuse and neglect is all these different areas and some companies, especially in age care, um, will probably just have a compulsory report on physical and sexual abuse. Um, out in the community, you may be expected to do a compulsory report on um, financial, like I said, that's actually breaking the law. It's actually now a criminal offence, even in the elderly. Um, and, but even emotional abuse, uh, neglect and abandonment, that can be a huge thing out in the community because, you know, it's um, they lock Nana in the room and just keep her in the room because they all have to go to work and there's no one to look after her. And that's actually neglect and abandonment. And uh, we need to report those things. And um, 
But within your company's policy procedures, your company might expect you to just tell the RN and the RN or the CN will be the one that decide whether they want to report that to the police. But a compulsory report means it actually has to be reported to the police within 24 hours. And it is all of our responsibility. They have changed the law about that. It's not just teachers and, and um, doctors and nurses that's mean to, but we as care workers are actually classed as um, assistant and nurses are also responsible for reporting that. Um, and there's these indicators that makes us realize something, something's up. This, you know, something wrong. Um, the change in their personality, personality odd behaviors, uh, unexplained injuries that got bruises here and there. Um, they, uh, you know, um, they refusing uh, to leave the client when we are with them. There's, a, you know, a family member there or something like that. They be left unclean or uncared for, um, uh, you know, unsafe living environment, changes in a financial situation. They suddenly say, oh, yeah, no, it's okay. I don't have to go to town today. I'll be all right. What's there is enough for now. And you realize maybe there's something more to this. Maybe she doesn't have money. Maybe somebody else took her pension, you know. That's why she doesn't want to go to town and she doesn't want to tell you that her grandson has been around and took her money or something, you know, but we have to watch out for things like that. And um, yeah, uh, over and under medication, that happens a lot too, because they they reach for medication as a way to um, manage behaviors and things, which is, you know, just uncalled for. Um, yeah, so there's some assessments that may be done by RNs most of the time, skills assessments, knowledge assessments, and performance assessments. Um, and these assessments will give us an indicator where the person are at. It's not just, this, you know, uh, not just um, a physical uh, job the whole time. We also 